Welcome to Advanced TV Herstory, a podcast dedicated to bringing you the best moments in television or television storytelling that involve women. This podcast looks at great performances or women who pioneered the industry, or we've been known to go behind the scenes to better understand how the women's movement affected that which we saw on the tube. Knowledge is power. We know that there are excellent women in the field today to assume roles behind the camera and in front of it, and the more we know, the more we can demand parity in representation and pay. Advanced TV Herstory hopes you'll be part of the change so that the point of view of women is seen, heard, and understood in the present tense. I'm your host, Cynthia Bemis Abrams. Oh, TV Herstorians, anytime we go back to the 70s, It's a deep, deep dive into the foundations of what we see on TV today. There's just so much there. The fashion, the hair, the dialogue, which usually, but was not always written by men. Oh, wait, nothing's changed on that front. The plots, however, they were changing. And some of them might have been right out of vaudeville or a variation on an I Love Lucy Ethel shtick, or they might weave in social themes that simmered top of mind. These were the 70s, after all. Change brought on by the baby boom was taking hold. Now, Norman Lear helped us through those final growing pains by holding a mirror up to America's face. What we saw wasn't pretty, or free of wrinkles, or wealthy, or silly, sophomoric humor. And that sort of typifies the 70s as well, I can say, having lived through that decade, which I consider the longest decade ever. Norman Lear gave words and presence to voices that were emerging and that were viewing their own obsolescence. Now, what do I mean by this? We're looking today at the TV series Maud, which planted a brilliant, tall flag on the landscape of American feminism. It aired from 1972 to 1978, six seasons of a unique look at relationships, social matters of the day, life's aspirations and fears, all through the eyes of a woman approaching 50. This segment of Advanced TV History revisits the relationships, themes, and incredible acting and dialogue that makes Maud a pillar of TV history. The Maud story starts with her creator, Norman Lear, and is carried by the incomparable and talented Beatrice Arthur. In 1971, the landmark TV hit All in the Family debuted. And this is the part where the obsolescence comes to mind because Norman Lear's creation put America's change right in the living room via the conversations that took place in Archie Bunker's house. You had Archie, Edith, daughter Gloria, and her husband, Michael Stivick, take turns wrestling with big topics. Michael Stivick was Jewish, and Archie wasn't, and there was anti-Semitism racism, freedom of speech, many topics of feminism that got bandied about by Edith and Gloria, patriotism, veterans, Vietnam, Richard Nixon, and all of this was through a generational lens. As it was happening in real life, an episode often ended with no resolution, just an open-ended question for the viewer to ponder. So working to keep the show fresh, Lear tells my favorite website, METV Legends, how it is that he introduced a woman character in the second season of All in the Family, who would end up giving it to Archie as well as he dished it to others. It was time after eight or ten shows or something to have somebody on the show that would kill Archie verbally, you know, that would could destroy him. And... Uh, you know, Mike fought with him all the time, and, and Mike was as poor a liberal in terms of being well-founded in his views as Archie was a conservative. So so I thought, given my family life, it had to be somebody out of his deep past that could hammer him over a 20-year period, you know, that could reach back into his history. And so... I, I'd always loved my friend Beatrice Arthur. So we wrote in the character of, uh, of Maud, a cousin of Edith's, right. 
who never wanted him to get married, who knew him that long, and did want her to marry this guy. And we brought her on. And we were three days in rehearsal when I knew that, uh, that I would hear from Silverman and you know, others to let's do a show with this woman. View All in the Family and Maude today, and you'll see that element of drama, delivery, timing, and tight writing that just isn't found today, or it's found rarely today. The live studio audience gave it a sense of real theater, as did the training of the cast members. B. Arthur, Gene Stapleton, Carol O'Connor, they all had acting chops. And just a reminder, it seemed like a majority of the dialogue in the show was yelling, even when the plot called for them to all be laid up with the flu in the winter of 1973, which was the very reason for Maud's stay. Shut up, all you sh- There's a person at the door. <laughs> Maud! Edith! Wait a minute. Didn't you get my telegram telling you to stay the hell away from here? Of course I got your telegram telling me to stay the hell away from here. Edith, honey, ma'am, you can rest easy now. Maudie is here. Oh, jeez. Are you waiting for a special invitation? I said breakfast is on the table. I heard you. So did every moose up in Canada. Listen, Archie, I'm not going to let you upset me. I'm only here because of Edith. The fact that you happen to be here with her is beyond my control. Like any other freak of nature. Now, you can either come to the table and eat, or you can lie there and feed off your own fat. (laughs) And if you choose the latter, you could probably lie there for months. Little did anyone know at the time that ultimately anything Norman Lear touched would turn to gold. With little fanfare, decisions flew to spin off Maude and the Jeffersons, and from Maude came Good Times, which starred the incomparable Esther Roll as Florida Evans. B. Arthur recounted her adjustment to the character Maude, perhaps the first female TV character who, out of sheer personality, was larger than life. I was so amazed when uh, Maude became this, you know, this political activist, because I always, um, I mean, I always spent a lot of time deciding whom to vote for, but uh, I never carried around petitions or anything like that. If I did, when it came to animal rights, you know, then I was very active. But um, no, not politically. So interesting, because as a result of Maud, I mean, I, people just assumed that I was, you know, the staunchest feminist, which I was not. You know, not at all. But they thought of me as um, the Joan of Arc of the whole woman's movement. That's a clip from Emmy TV Legends. And it's Arthur recounting her memories, playing Maude, and being part of such an incredible TV show. She was nominated five times for an Emmy for Outstanding Lead Actress in a Comedy Series and took home the trophy in 1977. She was also nominated for Golden Globes for Maude, as well as the show that she was in 10 years later. For the Golden Girls, she'd be nominated four times for the same category, uh, Outstanding Lead Actress in a Comedy Series, and she earned the trophy, the Emmy, in 1988. Her recall to Emmy TV legends of the selfless teamwork and effort put in by the writers and producers and the cast is a real sign of the humility that came with those long-standing, accomplished performers who had found a quality home on television. And I look at this, and damn it, we were good. We were good. Bill Macy and Connie Bain and Rue McClanahan. I mean, we've been, I mean, we did great shows. The writing was wonderful, and the, the acting and the the joy of, it was, and everyone contributed, you know, it was never, 
There were never any egos involved or anything. It was just pure, unadulterated fun. But it was hard work. It was hard work. But just as the actor Carol O'Connor had very little in common with Archie Bunker in real life, B. Arthur wasn't 100% Maud either. Maud Findlay, with numerous husbands in her past, would have been born in the mid-20s and most likely would have worked during World War II. In the show, Maud attended college, and over the show's run, we track her real estate career, as well as her interest in government and politics. Outspoken on progressive issues, Maud often found herself walking the line between suburban white privilege and comfort and her political ideas. With a respectful live audience, great writers, and an incredibly talented cast, this made for momentous TV. So what was all this content about? Well, it was more than politics, you should know. And the guest appearances made all of it all the more memorable. Maud became one of those shows that was high profile enough to attract cameos of talented big names of stage and film. Among them, John Wayne, Eve Arden, Roscoe Lee Brown, Henry Fonda, Barbara Rush, Jill Clayburg, Richard Dysart, and Nanette Fabre. These folks joined the supporting cast, which developed in the first season, and pretty loyally stuck through the entire show's run, with very few exceptions. Bill Macy played Walter Finley, Rue McClanahan, who went on to star, co-star with B. Arthur in The Golden Girls, played Vivian, her neighbor and friend from college. Early in the show's run, Vivian married Dr. Arthur Harmon, one of Walter's old army buddies, and so Arthur became their neighbor as well. Maud had a housekeeper, which I don't know whether most middle American sensibilities knew what to think of that. But this recurring role provided as much skewer as plot, courtesy of Esther Roll as Florida Evans and Hermione Badley as Mrs. Naugatuck. This was an African-American and a Brit. They were accomplished actresses who complemented the tone that Lear set. Maud's daughter, Carol, and grandson drove a few plots, too. So enjoy this riff, this example of perfect comedic timing between guest star and TV pioneer Eve Arden, who played Maud's Aunt Lola, and the rest of the regular cast. First, the build-up. When this aired, Arden was approaching 70 years old, but that didn't stop Aunt Lola from going after her nemesis, Mrs. Naugatuck's new husband, rather than staying in and playing party games.
Depending upon your age, Eve Arden is a name that may not mean much to you today, but in the mid-70s, hers and those many other cameos showcased emerging talent and Broadway-caliber performances. Long before her guest role on All in the Family, B. Arthur occasionally appeared on TV shows and a few films, mainly in the 50s. In the 60s, she was a Broadway workhorse, cast as the first Yenta in Fiddler on the Roof, and earning a Tony Award for her portrayal of Vera Charles in MAME. These were musicals performed before high-tech amplification could boost a voice in a Broadway theater. Hence, B. Arthur's voice never needed any help, and thus in four episodes across the show's six-season run, Maud choreographed a show for charity, managed a telethon, led fundraising efforts that included a TV musical, and the city of Tuckahoe's televised bicentennial celebration. Oh, and in a runaway hit show with big talent, the lead occasionally got to break into song just because she could. Maud's TV family presented a number of social challenges. Walter's drinking rose to a level of concern in more than a few episodes, and this was pretty serious stuff for American TV in the day including the moment when, after a fight, Walter slapped Maud. Daughter Carol dated older men and younger men, including one whom Maud had gone out with in between husbands. Maud's grandson Philip, Carol's son, voiced the younger half of the baby boom, not afraid to challenge his mother or grandmother about their political or social morals. Women of all ages, however, heard Maud and her friend Vivian, her neighbor, her college friend Vivian, broach topics that had previously been off limits. Vivian got a facelift, which Maud initially criticized, until she went out and got one too. Maud worried about her marriage, which was her fifth, about her husband's fidelity, his drinking, their sex life, his success, her success, his depression, her sense of being unfulfilled. Maud got a hysterectomy. Maud encountered a man who had attempted to rape her 30 years prior. And she found her progressive principles and ideals challenged more than once while sipping her drink from her Tuckahoe, New York living room. She ran for the New York State Senate and lost, but in the series' end, her political future wrapped up nicely. And I won't spoil it for you. I will simply say this DVD should be on your shelf. Few entire series from the 70s are worthy of a binge, and most episodes of Maud can be found on YouTube. But please consider buying the entire series on DVD, watching it, and then passing it along to the favorite feminists in your life. It's a veritable time capsule of social themes and wild 70s fashion. Channel surfing not long ago, I encountered the episode Maud Bears Her Soul, which aired in November 1975, season four. It's literally a one-woman show, the premise being that Maud is seeing a psychiatrist, who we never see or hear. View it for the writing, the acting, the content, the force. It's called Maud Bears Her Soul, Season 4, Episode 9. But no controversy was spared in the making of this series. Norman Lear loaded the cannon and just kept firing until America was more comfortable with the sensitive issues of the day. And that's his legacy. Due to Title IX and the ERA, the women's movement was in full force. It wasn't as united as it could have been, as we can see in hindsight, and this TV show sometimes drove that point home. They may have only had 22 minutes, but those writers more often than not honed in on a complex issue and exposed it, not necessarily with an answer, but for sure with enough fodder for both sides to hear. And that, my friends, was back when America was okay with hearing the other side of an issue. In season one, Lear and writers took chances that even through today's lenses seem controversial, if not, some might say, impossible. Lear tells METV legends... The abortion shows, uh, two episodes were the ones that really riveted, you know, the country in terms of that degree of controversy. Decided Maud would be pregnant. Uh, and that came about because uh, the, the scene in which Maud tells her close friend, Rue McClanahan, that she's pregnant, you know, we knew that was 
a lay down, brilliant comic moment, you know, that would, there was minutes of laughter and a great situation for these two women. But when we went deep into it and explored all of the things we might have done, false pregnancy, ectopic pregnancy, anything but facing what about this almost 50-year-old woman having a baby, it just wasn't in our nature by that time to wish to take the easy way. So then we had to face, should we have the baby? Would Maud have the baby? In this first season, Maud is 47, part of a generation that didn't discuss birth control, didn't discuss menopause, and had limited options for even managing their periods. The understanding even of what a late-in-life pregnancy could mean for the mother or the baby was sketchy when we think about what medicine was like in the mid-70s. Yet surely this was a situation silently managed throughout America by women and their best friends of all classes, colors, and religions. Oh, well, look, why don't I just get the hell out of here? Vivian, you leave me alone at a time like this and I'll rip your heart out. Well, then tell me what's the matter. Am I your best friend or not? Now, what is it? Vivian, Vivian. Vivian, how long have we known each other? 22 years. 22 years. We've been through an awful lot together. Oh, a lot. Six husbands, your two, my four. Right. For 22 years, Vivian, we've been, we've been everything to each other. I mean, there wasn't a confidence that we couldn't share. We've, we've been like sisters, Vivian. Like Like sisters, Maude. Then can I trust you to keep a secret? (laughs) What is it? Don't look at me, Viv. Vivian, I'm pregnant. (laughs) You're kidding. Aren't you? You're pulling my leg, Maud. Maud? Maud, please pull my leg. Vivian, at age 62, I'll be the mother of an Eagle Scout. With all of America watching, Lear used his soapbox with the statuesque five foot nine B. Arthur booming voice standing atop it to even educate women, daughters, moms, and grandmas about birth control options. Now, Maud, I grant you that the autumn years of life is not the ideal time to be raising a baby. The autumn years of life. (laughs) Arthur, leave it to you to sound just like a Hallmark card. How can you be so insensitive? Not just to my mother. Arthur, when are men going to take some responsibility for birth control? It's happening. It's happening. Vasectomy, for example. More and more men are talking about vasectomy all the time. Walter's been talking about it for two years. Take it from me, Arthur. Talking about it doesn't work. (laughs) Harry Adams just had a vasectomy. Good man, Adams. Good man, Adams. Arthur, one man's vasectomy is not the answer. Look, the way things are going, if if even older people like my mother and Walter start behaving like rabbits, well, we're all going to end up living like sardines. Beautifully put, (laughs) Carol. So in season one, this two-part episode tackled a controversy that had only recently been settled, and I use air quotes around that word settled, by the Supreme Court. It featured a woman's perspective. It's season one, episode nine, entitled Maud's Dilemma. This is must-see TV. Mother, what's wrong? Now, you've got to share this with me. Honey, I'd give anything to share. (laughs) Vivian, please, please. All right, Carol, come here, honey. Let me try to tell you something. Yeah, Carol, you remember when you were just a little girl, maybe... Oh, five or six years old, and you used to come to me and you'd say, Auntie Vivian, you know my mommy, too. You tell her for me, I want a little brother or sister. You remember that? Oh. Well, honey, your mother has finally decided to grant your wish. putting me on. You've got to be putting me on. 
Mother, tell me it's not true. All right, it's not true. <laughs> now, just promise me you won't get jealous and hit the baby. <laughs> but how did it happen? <laughs> mother, mother, you're 47 years old. Walter's 49. This is no time to be having a baby. No time for who to be having a baby? Miss Carol. Oh, not me, Florida. Mrs. Cavanaugh? Oh, not me, Florida. <laughs> oh, my aching back. These weren't sophomoric laughs. They were nervous ones. Women in the audience saw women in situations that weren't pie-in-the-face ha-ha. They were tinged with irony and sarcasm, where eye-rolling was okay and women could be frank. The TV series Maud deserves a place on the highest shelf of herstory. When you watch it today and you realize that it is aged as it should, like a rare book you'd find in a library, it can't tell you how the world is today, but it was written with such rich detail of the time that it was that it transports you back. It's a solid show that can't be unraveled. The writing and the acting are tight. The message, on the other hand, blows mightily or stands still, depending upon political winds. Thankfully, we have YouTube and DVDs that enable us to keep this treasure alive. Loyal listeners, if you've been with Advanced TV Herstory from the beginning, you know we'd get to Maud and B. Arthur sooner or later. Right now, the political winds are at Maud's back and fashion's eye to the 70s, complete with those incredible long vests and long coat pantsuits, make the show a feast for the eyes and ears. Clips from this installment were found at METV Legends interviews with Norman Lear and B. Arthur, and series episodes can be found on YouTube. Do you have a mod memory or idea for a future podcast? Please shoot a note to advancedtvherstory at gmail.com or tweet us at at TV Herstory. If you've got a relative or friend who doesn't understand that a podcast can be just audio streamed, no download necessary, please show them how to just pull up the show at Libsyn, L-I-B-S-Y-N, that's our hosting site, and press play and listen right from their iPad or desktop. It's that simple. And don't you want some older relative who really does remember Maud to be able to have this little walk down memory lane? Before I thank you, I'd like to thank David Brown, my audio technician, for making this podcast sound better and better with every segment. So at this time, I'll just say thank you for the recommendations, the reviews, the referrals of this podcast to people in your circle who really, really like TV. Thank you, and thanks for listening each and every time. I'm your host, Cynthia Bemis Abrams.